all. Well, uh, John, again, I appreciate your being willing to uh, give of your time and uh, and engage me in some conversation. And last last conversation, I kind of you know I had the PowerPoint ready and kind of drove it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I enjoyed I, that a lot, by the way. Good, good. Well, maybe we'll uh, we can do something like that again sometime. I would, um, I, would I would welcome that. I would welcome that. I, you know, I always have lots of questions and it, it, what's fun, what's fun about talking to you is that in some ways I'm sort of on the other end of things because I make so many videos. Many of the people that I talk to have seen a lot of my videos, but I don't know them. But now I've watched a good number of hours of you and your <laughs> awakening from the meaning crisis. And, and maybe, maybe one way to begin is I've been thinking a lot about your relevance realization. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what's what's fun about a powerful idea is, as 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 I continue to realize the relevance of that concept, <laughs> I I bump, well into, well <laughs> I bump into it a lot. And yeah. you know, I in my in my conversation with with Christopher Mastro Pietro, which is also on my channel, which was which was a a a, a lovely lovely conversation. Oh, I, so beautiful. I, he is he is so gifted. And oh yes, just I, I, eloquent and lyrical, and, and and also so open and genuine. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He, that's why he's one of my dearest friends. He's just he's just such a deep and authentic and caring person. So so I asked him, uh, you know, I'm working on this God number one, God number two stuff, yep, uh, and trying to get a handle on really what happened in the light of the Protestant Reformation, what caused that, and then especially what happened in the Enlightenment and, and the, the major transitions that the culture took mm -hmm. when, mm -hmm. you know, with this Darwin was obviously a, a critical, pivotal moment in the culture. And I so was fascinated by how your relevance realization mapped onto this, um, you know, whatever it is that, that Darwin pointed out and, and the selection and the process that it has in selection. And so then I asked Chris, and I'd, I'd like to hear your take on it. What's, oh, no. what's the relation, <laughs> yeah, here we go. What's the relationship between relevance realization and God? Now I want to, before I, you know, get myself or you into any hot water. I, I want to, I want to, when I'm using the term God here, I mean, there's, there's a real reason that the Jews hold back from. Uh, the, totally, totally. From totally. I, I, get that. And I, do, and I respect that. Yes. But um, when I use it, I'm, I, I'm pulling back a bit from how I think many Christians naturally use it in their own religious discourse. And of course, by, by saying that, I'm not denying that reality, obviously, no, no, as a Christian no, no. minister. I, I, no, no. But when... But you're the, trying but to build the, a bridge. That's right? right. You're trying to build a bridge between that Christian discourse and people like Jordan Peterson, who you've had such an interest in, yeah. or some of the debates with, by, you know, with Brett Weinstein and others. Yep. I understand what you're trying to do. I mean, I, I, I am not... I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to attribute to you that you're abandoning your, your, your doctrinal commitments. That, that, that's not, we're friends and that's not what I, I, I'm interested in. So I'm trying to help you out here. I, I see what, you're, what you're, you're trying to do. You're trying to build a, a more abstract, and not in the pejorative sense of that word, a more abstract bridging construct so that dialogue and discourse is afforded. So let's take it that that's what you're doing. That's provisional, but it's not, that doesn't mean it's frivolous or trivial. And, and so my God number one, because one of the things that I saw that I've been seeing since Darwin was there was this, and, and, and you can see it in Luther, mm -hmm. um, and your take on Luther, I, I was very interested in, and because I had just, at the same time, I was reading a really wonderful book on Luther and Erasmus, and, and it's clear that, you know, one of the things that happens with Luther is that there's this very Barfieldian turn where, where Christianity very much moves from an embedded sacramental state into a very psychological state. Yeah, and I, I, I argued for that, and I don't know if you totally agree with this terms, but I argue with that you're, you're getting a massive shift 
that's already taking place towards the propositional, and there's a there's a huge loss of the participatory. Yes, yes. In, in a very in, in in the bar in the Barfieldian sense, and in the sense that I've tried to articulate. Of course, Luther has people participating in the church. I'm not talking about participatory knowing in that sense. I'm talking about in the sense that I developed in the course. Yeah, I, but but also the you know in, in terms of the mind and matter duality. Yes, yes, the, yes, very much. I mean, it's it's not a. It, it makes perfect sense that the Protestants would completely fracture over the Eucharist, be in their inability to define it, yes, and and yes. Calvin, of course, famously talks. In fact, I was in a Korean um, a Korean church examination, and I don't know why people let me do what I do, but I asked them. I said, "Well, if Christ is present in the Lord's Supper." Is Christ present and tell me how? So then I take all this Protestant stuff and map it onto all kinds of Korean history, and it's it's just yeah. crazy making. But <clears throat> but the Pro so Calvin says, well, Christ's real presence or his his spiritual presence is in the Eucharist, and it's it's sort of punting because it's yeah, yeah. not yeah, answering yeah. the question, no. and and of course transubstantiation is a highly technical philosophical way to address that question. So you've got all this stuff going in Luther, and then you get to Darwin, and we've, we've got firmly established this duality between natural and supernatural, and, yeah. and that, as I listen to, to you and many others, that's, that's really a flashpoint between religious community and, and non, yeah. uh, whether even religious is the proper distinction between these two communities. But, you get into Darwin and Darwin, it's at the moment of Darwin and to what degree does he create this or to what, to what degree does he mark it? But there's this line of demarcation where now we no longer need a, a mind to explain the, you know, it comes, it comes a yeah. mind to explain movement and process and development in the cosmos. Yeah, and yeah. and so all of that earlier stuff that I think you nicely mapped out with Galileo and the yeah. the death of everything it's taken up into Darwin in a profound way. That's in right, a very profound way. And 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 so then what I noticed with your relevance realization <laughs> that I I I I continue to that that idea as you know, and I I very much appreciate that I probably am only beginning to understand it. Or understand what you mean by it, but it's a it, it's a fascinating bridge into the question of agency, mind, and what we have come to imagine in C.S. Lewis's Miracles, for example, things that, that go book, on their way. own. Oh, did you? Okay, yeah, I'll be I'll I, be curious I, to hear what you think of it. I bought it on your advice. So, oh, well, thank you. and the, and the discarded image as well. Yeah. So, sorry, I've done enough talking. I want to hear what, what, what you think. So, rational, okay. uh, relevance, realization, and God, how do they, how do they map? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't know, I don't know if I'll get all the way to God, but I'll try, I'll, let, let, let me start and see how, 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 I, how far I can get. Um, so, I think everything you said was uh, very astute and insightful. Um, and the, 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 the whole point of relevance, realization is to pick up on something metaphysically implied, a couple things metaphysically implied by Darwin. Uh, and, and so I'll just state them. I, I understand that there might be you know, controversy around them, but let's just state them. Uh, just to continuing the line of argument and you make is that but what Darwin seems to show is you don't need mind to explain the emergence of mind. Okay. And for me, that that if you'll if you'll I don't mean this, I don't mean this sacrilegiously. That was a godsend, right? That was like this is right. I was like, oh. This is a way in which we can finally break the homuncular fallacy about when and we because we keep trying to explain the mind and we keep what you know how do I see well there's a little man in my head that sees right the homuncular fallacy and this this is but and part of the work I did um, in the relevance realization papers that I published uh, with Kim Lillicrap and Blake Richard and Leo Ferraro was show how we keep running into this way we we keep trying well how does well, how does the mind work? Well, the mind is based on memory. Well, how does memory work? Well, there's just, just like this little guy, you know? And so it's like, ultimately, if we want to explain we, in a non-circular fashion, 
I, and, and I get it that some of your viewers might, might say, I don't think there is such an explanation on offer, but I'm, gonna, I'm presenting my position. As a scientist, I would say, well, if we're ever going to explain the mind in a non-circular fashion, we need some account of how mind emerges out of non-mind, or as I at least make it less tendacious, how does intelligence emerge out of processes that are not themselves intelligent? And this is exactly what I saw, right? That this is what's implied in Darwin. I'll pick up on that in a sec. The other big implication, which you've talked about repeatedly and made some very good use of, by the way, especially uh, in your criticisms of Weinstein, right, is that there's, there's no essence to fittedness. There's no essence to fittedness, and that has enormous metaphysical implications uh, for understanding the mind, uh, understanding personhood, and I'm argue, as I'm arguing this series, and you're probably following that argument, even to our notion of sacredness, things like that. So those were the two things that came out. And then what I started to see um, is that um, there was a third thing. Uh, so I wanted to capture both of those, this idea that there is no essence to fittedness, right? And that uh, what, we're, what we're doing is trying to get an account of how intelligence emerges out of non-intelligent processes. And then I saw, with the help of Tim, uh, I remember the train rides to Kingston uh, with a lot of uh, uh, fondness, actually, because um, he was at Queen's at the time, what we started to see was, you know, that this problem of explaining intelligence from many different avenues, and I go over this in detail in uh, the series, all converge on this issue of how do we zero in on relevant information and ignore irrelevant information? How do we deal with the combinatorial explosive nature of reality, of the options we have for action, all of that stuff? That there's just a vast amount of information we can pay attention to. There's a vast number of options for behavior we can consider. There's a vast amount in our uh, long-term memory, and there's vastness in the number of connections and permutations between all of those. So that argument is more detailed in the, in the series. I won't re reproduce it at length here. So we saw that that was the key thing, and that what we saw what was emerging, and still emerging, and, it's, and I, I was very careful to say I wasn't presenting sort of the final version of this. I was trying to, that's why I had to keep it at a somewhat abstract level. What was emerging, though, out, uh, out of the cognitive science, and especially the machine learning, was something deeply analogous to Darwin, right? And we needed a self-organizing dynamical system, and that we could explain what was happening in relevance realization in, in a very strong analogy. And then I strengthened the analogy, and I'm basically arguing that there are two species of a shared genus, whereas Darwin's model is biological evolution, you know, evolution across species. I'm talking about something like sensory motor evolution, how the sensory motor loop as it cycles is constantly evolving its fittedness to the environment and then that leads up into salience landscaping, et cetera, et cetera. And so what all of that uh, uh, sort of afforded is, well, wait, this is it. This, is, this, is, this helps to explain a lot of things. It, it, it gives a possible, I think a plausible um, explanation of how intelligence emerges. And then I think that also gives us a purchase, and this will be more controversial, so I'm willing to talk about it more, but I'll just state it here now. Uh, uh, some important, you know, key aspects of consciousness also uh, can uh, emerge in that fashion. So that was one thing, and then it helps to explain the difficulty we had with coming to a scientific account. Not only the homuncular difficulty, is that we were trying to find sort of a definition of relevance. We were trying to find the final account or as a term I sometimes I, I, I use to, because it's deliberately provocative, the final solution, right? Some total, you know, totalizing complete uh, definition or account. Um, and I, I'm alluding to, of course, all the horrific things that that might have with it. And so the fact that there is no such essence to relevance, right, was also explained by this. So what that all meant is I thought I, well, I would still argue that what was happening is a, a, a sustained attempt to replace a Newtonian way of thinking about the mind with a Darwinian dynamical systems way about uh, understanding the mind. And I thought, uh, uh, it, 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 so it, it addressed all those issues. It, it looks like it's solving all those problems. And, and then it's giving us a fundamental way of bringing Darwin into our self-concept. And so that makes it, I think, um, uh, I hope it's at least a very plausible theory. And if it turns out to be false, that the, the, the theory that shows it to be false will have, will have been afforded a lot in, in, in overcoming it. <laughs> and, 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 and so, you know, that, that, that's kind of what I, I'm committed to. And then, of course, what I'm, I'll just talk a little bit longer because I want to hear what you have to say. Um, and then what I've been trying to do from that, you know, there's the big plausibility argument, 
is I've been trying to say, okay, given that it's this fundamental kind of a thing, it should have deep implications for our self-understanding. And then I try to show how you can use this relevance realization machinery, I think, to talk very insightfully about many key aspects of what broadly fall under, you know, spirituality, et cetera. And, and in that sense, I'm trying to do the structural functional organization of the meaning, making meaning, cultivating machinery, and how that's bound up with our experience of mystery and sacredness and self-transcendent. And I want to say one more thing. Um, for reasons I've just articulated, though that, that, you know, lectures 26 to 32 are the hardest in the series, in my opinion. And, and you can tell. People are, oh, this is tough. And I get that. And um, all I can say about that is, is I, I tried to make that material as accessible as I could, but there, there is, there, there's a certain level, if I, I can't, you know, I can't get outside of a very sort of technical, you know, mechanical, very complex way of trying to work this through because that's just what we're, I mean, we're trying to do something, you know, quite thorny and difficult uh, in, in trying to get that Darwinian model into the understanding of the nature of intelligence and ultimately, as I say, and I'm trying, and I, you know, I use this word respectfully, spirituality, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, so I haven't got to God yet, but I, I haven't thought, got to God yet. But I, so, but I, I, I want to give you a chance to talk, and then I, I will. I, I'm not going. I'm not. I'm not copping out. I will come back and try and get to no, that. Okay. Well, well, good so far. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I, it's interesting. I, I was. I almost made a video. Actually, one of the very few aborted videos. I, I, I was making one, and I gave it up. But I've been rewatching the conversation you had with Jordan in February 2015 and yeah. the Newtonian and that that was a it what's fun about circling back around to conversations like that is I I'd listened to that conversation a number of times in the past but now having gone through your course you know yeah. I I have a much better understanding I mean here's here's one fascinating aspect of of thinking and hearing and knowing and perceiving it's this, it's this sort of fractal aspect of it. I could listen yeah. to that conversation and think, okay, I get it. And then I learn a little bit more and I hear it and I think, oh, I get it better. I mean, and, and, and often with good conversations, good books, that's the, I mean, that's the, that's the nature of it. And, you know, part of why, I mean, when I, I remember when I first started paying attention to your course, I got, a, I was starting, I got a lot of crap from a lot of Christians because, oh, you know, you don't want to listen to that. And, and but i but i immediately saw how the i immediately saw and this is again one of the things i got from jordan early on the upping of the resolution on a lot of the processes that i just as a pastor and a person had observed that many of the things that you were describing you were shedding light on them and 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 that didn't that didn't disenchant them or demythologize them for me no. because you know i i these are we're human beings and i've long observed given the various different cultural locations at which i've had an opportunity to very closely observe religious and irreligious people you see commonalities and yeah. so when you see a practice in the christian church you can say okay well that's that's in some ways analogous to this practice over here. That doesn't shake me or threaten me. It's it's actually C.S. Lewis talks about it in in a very interesting essay he has on transpositions. That this this word that I continue to try to say correctly, acceptation. You said it correctly. Oh, where where you know we are we are limited creatures, and so multiple realities have to use limited frameworks in order to express themselves and we can understand co-mappings via the acceptation and that really goes both ways oh sure uh, i mean and that, that's all the way through i mean so you know that the area of the brain that's for right you know manipulating your right hand gets exapted for syntactic speech and you know this is michael anderson's really seminal work on this and of course that's him applying the darwinian metaphor also initially to biological evolution but now increasingly towards cognitive processing so right. I, I i think this is i think this is the future 
of cognitive science in, in a lot of ways. And I, I think the trailblazer for that was Evan Thompson and the deep continuity hypothesis that I'm, like that we'll see, I, I'll use your term, you know, important transpositions between uh, the, the principles by which biology operates and the principles by which cognition and consciousness operate. I also want to say one other thing about this. Um, um, and I don't know what, what my intent is, it's, is it reassurance or, 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 or just reinforcing what you're saying, but one of the things that I have regularly done when I taught Buddhism in Cog Sai, for example, is to talk to people who designate as religious, uh, you know, at various points in the course when the course is over. And, and so, sorry, this is not meant to be self-promotional, it's meant to, you know, uh, contribute to our, our discussion. And overwhelmingly, they gave a response similar to what you did. It's like, no, what you did, you know, I understand that you have criticisms and blah, blah, and they say that, but they say, what you did was you provide me this vocabulary, this grammar, this way of thinking. It really helps me get more deeply into, right? And, 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 and so I'm hoping, because I'm not anti-religious, right? I'm hoping uh, that, that, I mean, I have deep criticisms of religion. I, that's part of my job, and, and right? But, if, you, if, if you'll allow me this, they're, they're made in good faith. And, um, and, and, so, and it is always a concern to me uh, that uh, I, I, I don't come off, at, I don't, well, you know, I don't believe in destroying and debunking. I want to, uh, I, I, I want to, I want to, I, I want to address the meaning crisis. That really is what I want to do. And if, if you, and I believe you can, if you can find a way within Christianity to do that, and I can help you, that's really and sincerely great. I am happy with that, right? <laughs> like, I, I don't believe that religion poisons everything or it's the great evil. Religion has been responsible for some great evil, but so is the state, so has the market, so have institutions, like blah, 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 blah. Okay, so let, I wanna put all that you know, tar and feathering, anything aside, I want to, like, what are the best things we can do for the most number of people that will help to address the meaning crisis? That's the overall thing I, I'm working on. Now, I happen, like I say, I think that there's implications, and this, we might circle back around now. I think there's implications about, you know, uh, you know, sacredness and the sacred, and what does that mean ultimately? I, I'm trying to circle back to your yep. Yep. Uh, question yep. about God. Yep. And so... And then this is something that's also going to come out later um, in episodes uh, 46 and 47, a bit of 48, when I talk about Heidegger uh, and, um, and I talk about the critique of Anzo theology and things like that. Also Tillich and, you know, Tillich and Young and Corbin and Barfield. I present the argument. I think it's very clear in Corbin and Tillich and Young. Um, and Heidegger that there's non-theism going on. I, I think it's I think it's at least a, a, a something to consider for Barfield. We could we, maybe we can have a discussion about that once I've done that because I I really because I I really appreciate that. Maybe also talk to Mark Vernon about it. Uh, but so one of the things I've been trying to get at was and I use Fleermacher's distinction and I, I gave it my own terminology between the experience which I call sacredness and whatever is the metaphysical or ontological basis of that experience. Right. And then I try to show um, what I think the experience of sacredness is in terms of the relevance realization machinery. And I can't see that being too challenging, uh, you know, because it seems like, oh yeah, so I can, because now we're talking about the experience of it and I can see how it's working, right? And then I move to a proposal about that, uh, which is, well, one of the things that seems to be implied by the account of relevance realization, if you think it's saying something about important, insightful about um, spirituality and the experience of sacredness, then that one of the like then you should pay attention to. I guess that's what I'm calling asking you to take seriously this implication that there is no essence to relevance. There is no final representation. There is no summative. You know, there is no perfect account. Uh, there is no absolute. And so I suggested that we understand the sacred not as any final object or subject, but as the inexhaustible moreness, the, the, right? That, so basically what, does, what, does, what, what can relevance realization always drink from without ever drinking dry? The inexhaustible moreness of reality. And, 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 you know, and that's not without precedent. And I'll, I'll make this case, you know, Barfield clearly is talking about this because he's, especially when he's making use of Coolidge and he's making use of 
you know, the early uh, post-Kantians because, you know, Schlegel is, they're, they're, they use that language repeatedly, you know, the, in, the finite longing for the infinite and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, 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 and the constantly moving horizon. And so I guess, <laughs> is this getting to answer your question? I guess for me, and I, I liked what Chris said. I, I might not say it as well as Chris said it. I know, uh, he said it really well. <laughs> for, for me, and I spend a lot of time, and I, there's going to be another, I've done it twice, and there's going to be one uh, another round where I talk about symbols and you know, what they mean for Tillich and Corbin and not, how they're not just psychological, they're not dismissive, they're not ornamental. I mean, and I, and I specifically reference them. I mean symbol in the way you know, Jonathan means it, Jonathan Pajot. I take God to be a symbol that puts the spirituality by which we experience sacredness into this ongoing, evolving disclosure of the inexhaustible moreness of reality. And that, that simultaneously picking up on how things shine in to the intelligibility of relevance and how they constantly withdraw into the combinatorially explosive nature of reality. And that's, of course, the homing of the sacred and right, right and, and, or at least the sacredness and, and, and the numinous. And so that's how I would understand God. I, I'm very hesitant to use that word uh, uh, because I think it's disservice to how most people would use that word because I, I don't think, oh, this is a long conversation. I think you could make a good case that many people, even within the Christian mystic traditions, talk about God in this way. I, I, you know, I see that in, in Pseudo Dionysus, I see it in Erigina, I see it in, in Gregory of Nyssa. I mean, the, the whole notion of epictesis, right, that constantly asymptoting, right, that we don't act, the, the blessedness is not to come to a state of rest, but to, 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 to experience perpetual self-transcendence. So, I, I mean, there's, there's definitely precedent in what I'm saying with, within people, uh, from people who, who you would, I guess, properly call religious. Um, but what I'm talking about seems to, I, I want it, I, I, I'm, I'm deliberately, I'll be, more, I'll be more direct, I'm deliberately crafting it so that it would apply equally to theistic and non-theistic religious experience. And, and in there, I'm deeply influenced by John Hicks and his work on, you know, the interpretation of religions is that, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be, and you'll disagree with me on this, I understand that, but there doesn't seem to be a principled way of sort of giving priority to the personal symbols over the impersonal, or vice versa, by the way. Uh, and so I'm trying to get a sense that would, in that sense, be non-theistic, not atheistic, right? But right. So, that, so that both a Christian, I would hope, it's a hope, uh, you know, uh, both a Christian and a Taoist could look at that and go, yeah, 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 that really, yeah, that's, I get that, I get that. And then I, tr I tried to make it personal by talking about my own relationship to Plato. Like, Plato is sacred for me uh, because, you know, I, I, I go to Plato and, and I have this anagogic transformation. I go out in the world because of the insights. I live differently. I'm transformed. I bring that world back and then I bring that to Plato and then something more is disclosed, right? And so Plato puts me into this ongoing, you know, fount of inexhaustible intelligibility, which isn't just an intellectual thing. I'm using it the way the Neoplatonist is. It's an existential thing. It's a modal thing. It's, it's the fundamental making sense. Uh, so that, that, I don't know, that's probably deeply unsatisfying to you, but that, that's, no, that's, that's my answer. <laughs> no, that's not unsatisfying. I mean, part of what, so, so I've, I obviously come at all of this as not so much a theoretician, but a, but a practitioner in sure, terms of, sure. in terms of, I'm a, I keep reminding people I'm a pastor. I'm not a scholar. I, I spend, I spend time with books, but I understand I, that disclaimer, Paul, but yeah. you're, you're very well read and very erudite and very articulate. Well, I thank mean, you. <laughs> so one of the things that obviously, so let me use the story of Chuck Colson. Yeah. Chuck Colson, you know, Richard Nixon's, it's always more comfortable to talk about people after they're gone and after some, some time has <laughs> passed. So, so Chuck Colson, Chuck Colson was Richard Nixon's hatchet man. Yeah. And I know the he, story again. Yeah, he yeah. having ahead. this existential crisis because this guy that, you know, Richard Nixon's a crook. And, and, you know, yeah. and so he's been taking the fall for him and he meets some other people who are, you know, very evangelical and 
Chuck Colson comes home to his wife one day and says, I've met the Lord. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. And his wife looks at him like, uh, you and I have been going to church all our lives. And yeah, yeah. obviously a transformation had taken place in him. And that transformation in many ways, and I don't want to get hung up on the social religious history in the United States. I mean, Jimmy Carter appears on the cover of Time magazine as president of the United States who's been born again. And so then everyone is having a personal relationship with Jesus. And, uh -huh. and all of this language is obviously not only expresses, but also maps. And, and as always, the religious and the political are always, you cannot pull these things apart. All of this stuff is going on. And, and this, deeply, this deeply impacts how, you know, the shape of churches as they go. But, but again, part of, the, part of the blessing of a religious tradition is that you continue to give the, your, um, the dead ancestors of your tradition a voice in the present. And sure. so you read and you listen. And, and so you, I mean, many of the things that you just talked about in terms of these are, these are not these are not alien representations of the ways yep. that people have used the word God. And, yes, I, and I, I, I listen. I, I agree with that. I and agree. I listen very carefully to people when they use the word God. And, and I just, I'm just always, this is actually my profession. I'm just always thinking, okay, what, what is, what is God in your world? How does, how does, you know, what is this God and how does, and we always use personal terms, how does he work? And then of course, as part of my job, I, every week I, with discipline, sit down and study at some depth, uh, a passage from the Bible, which networks to other passages from the Bible. And so, I mean, my practice is always working through these things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so even though obviously you and I have some differences of of opinion on a variety of things, many of the things that I hear you describing that sometimes I hear Christians really reacting to, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's not that alien what you're well, working through. I am explicitly like, and I've, I've mentioned it, I'm explicitly influenced by a number of those people I've just <laughs> mentioned. Um, and some of them, are clearly considered very, I mean, pseudo Dionysius is a pivotal figure in the history of Christianity, just a very pivotal figure. Um, I think you, I could also make some similar cases that there's analogous things said by uh, St. Augustine, so, right, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm just learning because of Jonathan's advice, I'm just getting into uh, Maximus right now uh, and Eregino, but you know, and, but I've also read uh, deeply in Buddhism, Taoism, and aspects of Vedanta, uh, you know, I've read the Upanishads many times, and uh, and and when I those are you know, like lectio divina kind of reading, where you know, reading and reflecting and meditating, um, and so I understand. I mean, and I even see sort of secular version of what happens to Coulson. And yes. so my my one of my prototypical examples is from the excellent story by Tolstoy, the death of Ivan Illich. That famous scene, that famous passage, that's, well, it's also a scene. You know, Ivan Illich had always known that he was going to die, the way you know that two plus two equals four, purely propositionally. But now he knew he was going to die, and that's a totally different thing, right? And that's, again, that kind of transformation. Um, and that, right, I, I, I'm not precluding the fact that Tolstoy has some spiritual overtones, but that in and of itself is not in particularly a religious experience. That's just a deep existential transformation. And so I'm trying, because it's important to do so, right, I'm trying to get a construct, a theoretical construct that can bridge across this whole continuum yeah. so that we can get all of these different experiences talking to you. I'm very interested, and I've read books on it, and, and this will strike some of your readers, maybe on both, some of your listeners, on both sides, I'm now thinking, <laughs> right? There's books on atheist spirituality. Some people, no, that's not possible. And both the, both the fundamentalist atheists and maybe some religious people. But, you know, you know, Cobb Spoonville has a book um, and he talks about, he has this profound mystical experience this, and profound, you know, awakening experience. And I know he's not isolated. There are people, uh, you know, you read Steve Taylor's book and other that go into these and come out and say, you know, I know there's no God. Um, again, no insult intended. 
and I want and, and and I want to say, well, what is it? Well, they and they use other language. Though you, I was in contact with ultimate reality or the deepest aspects of nature, or what Ursula Goodenough talks about. You know, the you know she transcends into rather than above the sacred depths of nature. And these people seem to be having also deeply transformative experiences, experiences that they want to use the language of spirituality to describe, and it seems to have very comprehensive impact on the how wisely they're leading their lives, how virtuously and compassionately they're interacting with us. I want to understand that as well. And I'm trying to use a term that, like I said, so that the Taoist and the Christian and the atheist who's had the waking experience or maybe, you know, you know, something in a psychedelic experience, and they, so that they can all talk about it. And, and again, not some wishy-washy term, a term that has been independently carefully constructed from, you know, scientific a scientific framework. That's that's my project, um, and you know I understand that I'm going to offend some people uh, across that whole continuum. What 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 your viewers need to know is you know uh, there's atheists that get pissed off at what I'm doing as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there's uh, uh, right and, and stuff like that. Uh, I, and I think I, I some sometimes I sit back and think, oh, am I doing am I doing it wrong? But other times I think, no, no. If I'm upsetting both sides, maybe I'm doing doing something deeply deeply right here. Um, well, and, and there's, you know, and I, my, my comment section uh, has been remarkably civil. Um, oh, I, I, you, you have a great community. And, and I, you know, it's, that's been one of the real joys of this whole thing. I do too, by the way, I want to just compliment my community. Like, they're just, <laughs> no, they, they, they really are. Because we have over a lot of overlap. Yes. Too. Yes. And, and, you know, and I think it's, I think it's important to, I think it's important to be generous to the tribalists as well, because mm -hmm. there's, you know, there, there's a there's a real importance in, I mean, tribal tribalism in us is there for a reason, and obviously, sure, sure. just you know, with all of your, you know, you, you have to suss out you have to suss out the relevance and the moves to make, and that of course is what wisdom is figuring out when to make this move, when to make that move, when to say this, when to say that, when to draw a hard line, when to soften okay. the line. I mean, all of those things are, are, are what we're always employed in. There, there, is, there is, interestingly enough, um, as, I, as I continue to think through your relevance realization, though, also a, a sort of, and, and maybe, it's, it, maybe it's my lack of, I, I find my lack of understanding I find I often have to listen to some of your lectures three, four times, and each time I begin, you know, the light begins to come on clearer and clearer. But th yeah. there is, there is with this very clever relevance realization gift that you've given us a sort of black boxness to it as well. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So <laughs> that uh, you might not know that that has a uh, that has a really pejorative meaning in cognitive science. So, oh, really? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, if somebody has a black box theory, it means you know, well, here's my black box, and there's input and there's output, and that's my theory, right? And so, I, I, I take it that maybe you're not invoking that, uh, or are you? Well, I don't. I you know, it's it's and and. So there's a and now now a lot of people when I when I say fudgy I don't mean really that in a pejorative sense. In fact, I was mm. one day thinking that that in some way I want to do a video that I thought I would get in a lot of trouble for, entitled you know, you know God is the father of all fudge and and because <laughs> you know sorry that's just great alliteration. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, because in a sense I mean we all need we all need I mean the reason you fudged in high school was because you couldn't make two, you couldn't make, you couldn't make the thing work. You couldn't balance the equation. You couldn't balance the equation. And to live in this world means that there's many, many equations we go through life not balancing because we simply can't. But yeah, it's, and this gets obviously into some of the, um, some, some of what pragmatism was, was good for, which was mm. that, okay, some things are good enough. And, and it's, we're being less wrong is better than being more wrong. And I, give, I, I give James more credit than that. And this is here where I would sort of, uh, I would like if I ever get the opportunity to debate in the good sense of the word, maybe dialogue. 
with Jordan Peterson about this. I think James is one of my heroes because he's a philosopher and a psychologist. He's a proto-cognitive scientist. I think I think James and pragmatism, especially more than Peirce's version, I think James's version, uh, I mean, he's doing something deeply analogous to what I do too, right? He yeah. takes it into trying to understand spiritual experience, and right? But I think what James does is I think he really discovers relevance as something distinct from truth. I mean, he doesn't have quite the right words for it, but uh, and I think he he I think he makes the mistake of thinking it can replace truth. I, that's one of my criticisms of of his pragmatism. Uh, but I think he he really discover what he's doing is discovering relevance as distinct from truth and how really really important it is. And that of course is also because he like me is coming out of this Darwinian framework and the adaptive the adaptivity of the organism is crucial to his psychology. So I just wanted to interject there because I think James is doing something really, really profound and I don't get to talk about him in the series. So I just wanted to take a moment here and just say, I, I think like he's, he, he, he's a pivotal figure in, in a very important way. And I think what, one of the things that we, when, so when you know, Watson comes in and behaviorism comes in, we lose all of that discovery about relevance and it sort of had to be recovered much later. But basically, you know, through, philosoph through philosophers that had to come back in. So I think that's just an important thing to say. Okay, so, so, the, so the, I don't know, now, now, now I'm gonna be careful, careful about the black box thing because I didn't <laughs> quite understand all of, the, all of the overtones that the term has, but, and, and, and it's in that sense that I had a sense of the, your, your RR, your relevance realization and God in, in sort of the, the fudginess of both of them. They they make uh, yeah. they make things work in a okay in so a, the, and I did something that uh, I, I did something that I think although I was very careful about it I can see how it perfectly uh, fits what your your criticism is and I, I said and, and I, I was very careful and I think I explicitly said I do not mean this disrespectfully and I mean this as an analogy but I said relevance realization is like what Paul says on the Areopagus in it we live and move and have our being. And right, and 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 I and I was very careful uh, because I didn't want to. I said I'm not. I'm using this analogous, but I'm trying to get people to understand that relevance realization is primordial, like in the Heideggerian sense. Our agency and the world emerge out of it. Our ability to communicate depends on it. Our ability to solve problems depends on it. How we make sense of things depends on it. How we navigate through the world. I mean, I've tried to give you arguments for all of these things. So. I didn't, I, I, I kind of regret having done that in some sense, because I did, I, I wanted to not be insulting, but I wanted to try and point to the spirituality of RR by, by invoking that and say, look, it's, it's like what, it's, 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 it's and I mean, and to be fair, Paul is quoting a Stoic there. That's I mean, right, that's, that's right. So, so <laughs> I, 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 you know, so I, I, I think, I, I think I'm, on, I, I'm okay there. Um, and so I was trying to get at, you know, there's that, there's, there's a deep, there's a deep, like, again, there's a deep primordial spirituality uh, to how we have to relate to uh, our, if we want to access it, activate it, educate it, enhance it, accelerate it, celebrate it, we're, these are going to, I'm arguing that these are going to be experiences, processes, practices that strike us as deeply significant, deeply spiritual in nature. That's oh, yeah. what I was trying, that's what I was trying to invoke with that. Uh, I don't, think RR is God. I, I've already said that to you. I, 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 that doesn't make, that, that, that ultimately doesn't make sense to me uh, in some deep way. Um, <laughs> what do you mean by God? Um, I mean, because that, that is the question. And that is, that is, I mean, all the way back to, you know, there's a reason, there's a reason for the third, at least how Protestants count commandments, there's a reason for the third commandment in terms of the graven image and um yes. and the you know I'm, I'm much more and and if you if you carefully if you carefully read the scriptures and you read them regularly the christian you know the old the hebrew scriptures okay. and the greek new testament you know you you begin to you know there, there's a there's a lot there that there's a lot there to think about and and this particular prohibition, in the context of the prohibition on a name for a very long time. Yes, yes. I mean, well, it it, right? it got you know it got 
it got transmitted to the name. I mean, it wasn't explicitly, I mean, being a Protestant, I say, well, you know, in a sense, we're like the Sadducees. Well, it's limited to the Bible. You can eat sausage on, on Fridays, the reformers said, because, you know, this whole not eating fish thing, you're, you, this continued extra extrapolation from the scriptures has its own hazard. And mm -hmm. so the third commandment, you shall not make a graven image. Whereas, you know, in, in all fairness, um, a Christian cannot attempt to relate to his or her deity without some kind of, without creating and fabricating some kind of mental construct or representation. Is it in, is it in Galatians where Paul says that Jesus is the icon of the invisible God? Is Colossians. I mean, oh, Colossians. Okay. So, but yeah. I know it's in there somewhere. So there, I mean, literally there, oh, sorry, that's the wrong word to use. For <laughs> but, 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 but directly, uh, you know, uh, Christ is considered iconic in some fashion. That's right. That's right. That's right. And, okay. and in, in all fairness to the Orthodox who make the point that icons and, and the same with your, the, the talk that you've, you've been doing on symbols, you know, you're to see through. Yes. Very you're much to see through him. Jean-Luc Marion makes that distinction between the idol and, and the idol sort of is full, like you, your gaze stops in it, but the icon is something that constantly leads you through and on. And I, I wanted to ask you about that, just about the name, because I've been told, and I don't know, I, I, I can't read ancient Hebrew, but I've been told that the standard translation I am that I am is misleading in some important ways. It's something more like I will be what I will be, or uh, I resist naming and, you know, I which sounds more like the Mornish that I'm talking about that's here, right, rather right, than, right. is that, is that true? Yes, I, I, that I, is true. Okay. Scholars, <laughs> scholars cannot agree on, in some ways, the most foundational symbol around which the entire Bible is constructed. <laughs> and, and it is, and you can, I can pull a Exodus commentary off my shelf here from various traditions and, I am that I am, I will be what I will be, and, and there they are hung up on it. And, and language is, of course, often intentionally ambiguous in many ways. Yeah. And it's in that ambiguity that, um, that we experience this moreness. And, yes. it's, and again, I mean, I, I'm, I'm so indebted to this course, the way you set up problems. I mean, you, you've just brought in so much, uh, you've just shed so much light on all kinds of things for me. I'm, you know, I'm deeply, I'm deeply grateful for it. Thank you it. for saying that. Thank you um, for saying that. Paul, that means a lot coming from you. Thank you. And, and so, you know, and so maybe to come back, come around to a second thing that I wanted to talk about, which sure. was, which was, which is very much connected, which is in fact the framing problem or the, yeah. Yeah, the and the frame problem, I, yeah. I spoke with, I spoke with someone who, um, who preferred to be, remain nameless and, and made the comment that, well, you know, Verveke and Peterson, they're both working on the framing problem. And we, we, had a, we had a public debate about it, actually. Is that on um, YouTube? Nope, it was never recorded. So Ooh. it's, it's, but it actually happened. It's not apocryphal, it actually happened. It was, our, the one that's on YouTube was the, was the, the second public debate we had. Uh, by the time we had the second one, we knew each other and we, we, were, we were friendly colleagues. Uh, but the first one, I didn't know Jordan, uh, but people had been saying, well, he talks about frame, the frame yeah. issue and uh, the frame problem and, um, and, and yeah, so we actually had a debate on it uh, uh, about uh, the best way to understand it and the best way to try and uh, you know resolve it. Um, well, and and so actually, this is the this is the the title of the aborted video that I didn't make, which is again, and maybe maybe I'm being a um, uh, an obvious Christian here and seeing God every place, um, <laughs> but you know, in in many ways the. God, God seems to, in some ways, be an ancient solution to the framing problem. Okay. So that, that, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Because, no, I, that, no. <laughs> so, yeah, please, please. Because, because if you notice, I mean, this, this lack of essence. Yes, of very much. This lack of essence, which... You, you, know, this, you mean the, the, the Abrahamic God, or, or perhaps some of the other ultimate, more ultimate gods in other traditions or something? Well, like I'm, you don't, I'm you, don't mean, you don't mean like Zeus or... or no, 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 or, no, yeah, yeah, no. Okay. And, and, you know, I have to, I should probably qualify, you know, everything I say in that I, of course, know my own tradition, which is Dutch Calvinism, better than 
even the other traditions of Christianity and far better sure. than other religious traditions. I'm, I'm a limited creature and relevance has been shaping me. <laughs> yes, very good. But, you know, when, it, when I, you know, I noticed um, Christianity is, has a long tradition, of, again, of talking about idolatry. Yes. And I think in many ways, idolatry is, a, is an issue of frame. Because, I think so too. Yeah, I, I because what, what happens is you take this is you take this one aspect, this one thing, perhaps an answer to a problem or mm -hmm. or the what seems to be the satisfaction of a desire, and you and you put that up on top of your hierarchy, and and you see the world through it. That's part and, of the critique of ontotheology, theology, where you understand being as a supreme being, right? right? Uh, and that's part of Heidegger's critique, and you can see it in Tillich. Tillich brings it up, and that's why he talks about the God beyond the God of theism, because he thinks of that that, that that's often the case. So well, I, just I, I have to learn a lot more about um, Heidegger and Tillich. I, I picked up I picked up Tillich's books, but it's in a if it's it's an, it's in a relevance race with way <laughs> way too much other stuff right now. Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about that at the end of the series. What I'm saying is I I I I, I agree with you, and that I'm pointing to other people who have informed my thinking behind why I'm agreeing to you. It's not just an opinion. I yeah. have sort of arguments that I'm bringing to bear to agree with you. I think that's right, uh, what you're saying, uh, that often you've got something inside the frame is then elevated. And then it, what it does is it, 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 I call it, it freezes the frame, right? That's and right. The, frame, the frame is no longer capable of evolving. And then it, defe it defeats. Right. Whereas the, sim the symbol is designed to be intrusive. It's designed to be, have this double face. It can, it, it, it it seduces you. Please don't misread that. What I mean is it, 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 it's easily drawn into your frame, but yet it's like, it's like there's a time bomb, an epistemic time bomb inside of it. It also right, explodes and draws you beyond your frame. And, and that's what I take. I think I, I understand Jonathan and other stuff, other people. That's what the icon is and things like that. Yeah. And I think the, the idol, I mean, the idol is pernicious because it kills um, some of the, some of the, I know your viewers don't like it when I use the word machinery. I'm trying to think of another, some of the fundamental, <laughs> some of the fundamental processes that are constitutive of our agency. Um, yeah. So uh, I think it, 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 I mean, I think it's, it, it, it I think to fall prey to an idol in our, our culture is beset by uh, idolatry in so many ways, right? And I think that's part of Fromm's, you know, critique about modal confusion. Um, yeah, I, I think idolatry, because uh, people often wonder why that's such an important commandment. And, and I myself did for a very long time, like, well, who cares about this? I don't believe in <laughs> Zeus and, you know, yeah, you know, Baal or any like, you know, what, like, what's that kind of, and then I realized, oh, if, if, when I got this realization, this is actually, this is why this is an important thing because idolatry is deeply, right? And, and you don't have to be religious to be idolatrous, right? Anything in which you're, you're, you're ossifying the relevance realization machinery, it could be because of an ideology, it could be because of your narcissism. I mean, it, there's all kinds of reasons in which you are freezing your framing uh, and then you're insisting that everything and everybody live within that frame I, I, and I, now, I now see why idolatry is such a pernicious sin. And, and so a couple of years ago, I read Tim Snyder's Blood Lens, which is not a book to read if you, if you are prone to depression, because yeah. this book is about the history of the land between Germany and Russia between the wars. And oh, it, is, yeah. it, is, it is a grim, grim story. Um, one of the things that Yuval Harari noted is, you know, in some ways, one of the ways to understand the Nazi regime is an idolatry of race, that there's this racial progressivism. And one of the ways to understand the Marxist regime is that an there's an idolatry class. of class. Yeah, and, I, and, I, I present something similar to that when yes. I did the Nazis and the communists. And I thought that I thought that episode, I think it was it was 24 or 25 of, of the crash. Yeah. That, that was a that was one of my favorite episodes. I thought it was a, a masterpiece. Anyway, um, oh, thank you. So so here we have from the Hebrews, a very countercultural thing where they actually have a temple which has statues in it. There's the, there's these huge cherubim. And then you have this Ark of the Covenant, which has little figurines on top of it. And, and the God itself is both 
everywhere and nowhere. Yeah, yeah. And and can't be represented. And then and Pompeii was it Pompeii sort of startled by that when they conquered Jerusalem? And that's right. Walks the in there. <laughs> Where's the God? <laughs> They're atheists. They're all atheists because there's no God here. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. And right. which which again is a is a tremendously interesting insight into you know a Barfieldian way of looking at things. Um, yeah. And 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 so if if my understanding of the Hebrew the Hebrew commandment that of course leads to and gets very much complicated by the Christian assertion that this Jesus of Nazareth is God, which, I mean, again, this mm -hmm. a statement like that suffers the death of, of 2,000 years of too much familiarity yeah. um, in terms of the shock that it should give us and the shock that it, that it was historically received with, which is clear right. from reading the New Testament. But that in, in some ways, this idea, this Hebrew God is, in a sense, a way to address the frame problem, which is very similar to the, the problem of idolatry. In that, oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting, Paul. I hadn't thought about that. So you mean, so the, this God is a God that, right, by his or her very nature, right, challenges idolatry, and therefore serves as a continual way to keep, and that would go, I'm just sort of- Yeah, keep going. That would go with that whole, that new, that reconceptualization of time and ourselves as temporally extended beings, the open future and the, how right. this is a God of the open future. That's right. Well, that's very, that's very insightful. I hadn't thought about that. So that, right, there, yeah. So it's a way of, and, and, sorry, I just want to riff on one more thing if that's, because that also, that also, because I argue that um, one of the things sacredness does for us is it, it does this higher order relevance realization between meta assimilation and meta accommodation, the homing us within the cosmos and the exposing us to the numinous. And so I hadn't put those two together, but that particular, your God, right? It, 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 it not only exemplifies, like it symbolizes that higher order relevance realization, it also constantly provokes it and keep it, keep, keeps right. it going. Is that what that's you're right. saying? Is that yes, fair? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, that's very good. I like that. That's very good. That's very good. Oh, that's it, very insightful. Thank you. Well, and, you know, because as you were doing your class and I was, you know, because at the board, so then Jonathan Bajo does this video this week on, on literal, which just made me smile. Jonathan, I, 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 want, I, I, want, I want to discuss maybe, maybe not debate, but I want, I want to get into philosophical argument with Jonathan about that because I've published a lot of stuff on metaphor. <laughs> and, uh, right, right. And so, you know, I, uh, <laughs> but, but, but see, and, and so I think we can make an argument that, you know, in the case, we can make an argument in terms of individual human beings that idolatry is terribly destructive. Because if you, let's say, the family, life is about the family. Well, like your family probably, values is, that's is, right. is a form of idolatry. That's right. It is. And, and you also mentioned the, you know, the romantic idolatry. Oh, my life is about this romantic partner. No romantic partner can bear. Yes. No human being can bear that weight. And we cause so much suffering through that idolatry. So right. much suffering. That's right. I see it in my own life. I see it in other people's lives. I see it in the lives of my students. So much suffering by that idolatry. And, yet, and, and that's why, you know, I come down so hard on rom-coms because we think, I mean, they think, oh, this is so fun. And no, this is, these are the temples of the idolatry of the romantic relationship. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And, and so the, what, what essentially I believe that this commandment does is say, well, there's only, there's only one proper safe frame, and that frame is outside everything that we have access to in this world. Now, you might say, well, how, how, how is that going to be the frame? Well, it's kind of a weird inversion because it, it, what it allows is, is that, well, is what we need from our frames is that and I use this example often, if I were to open the door of my office and there was a Bengal tiger in my office, well, suddenly that Bengal tiger would be up at the top of my relevance realization in terms of how so. I should act. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, and so what I think what, what happens 
is that God, which is, you know, a lot of what we talked about in terms of the strange relationship between your relevance realization. It's, I mean, what this God that we can't talk about has to be the frame through which this God that we can't talk about, this God that we can't see, but this God, which is, and by um, omnipresence in theology, we don't mean we don't even really know what we mean by that term <laughs> because <laughs> it, your, your honesty is very, very, very welcome. <laughs> well, it, it, it seems to mean something like um, he is available at any place at any time. Yet it's very clear in scripture that presence with respect to this God is something very special and very unique and also mm. very disturbing and destructive. How, how does it differ from the, the way the devil is said to be ubiquitous? Um, because the, I know the theologians invented that term as a distinction from uh, omnipresent. So the devil's really? ubiquitous. Yeah, well, that, that's, what I've, that's what I've read. I oh, mean, I, don't, I, 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 I wasn't aware of that. Well, so the idea is that the devil's ubiquitous because he could be anywhere and you, ne you, you have to be careful, right? It doesn't, he's not omnipresent, but he, he, can, he can come anywhere at any time. Uh, that's the idea. Well, 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 this, I mean, so another thing that at some point- we'll I can't believe that I, I'm bringing up the devil. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm bringing up the devil as a thought experiment because I, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to get you to clarify the distinction that you're, like the way you're, I want, I, 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 I'm assuming that the notion of omnipresence is something beyond the way the devil is, yes. I would say, myth, yes. you know, ubiquitous. Yes. There's yes. something more there. Yes. Right. Yes. It, the well. Go ahead. A huge challenge that that you face in your in your mission to banish the meaning crisis <laughs> is is humanity itself, obviously. And and one of the points that I made in one of my videos about the scalability that yep, actually yep. for something to go out broadly, I, I'm perpetually amazed at how effective religions have been in the human I, I, story that, that was an excellent video paul i took that very seriously i mean i know your viewers might not agree with this <laughs> because of how abstract it is but part of the reason why i made a video series was try was trying to make it more scalable and accessible right and part of why i want to do all of this and why i do my own q a i take that issue very very seriously and i also take you know what you said you know if if it's going to be like what a religion does it has to scale across you know, multiple domains, you know, it, you know, it has to be able to appeal to children because it has to help them to aspire to a sapiential development. It has to, you know, I, get, I, I agree with that. Yeah. And, and, and I was trying to articulate that, you know, that symbols have that role. And I also made a very clear case, and I talked about it a bit when, I, when you asked me to do the critique, that I think certain symbols are indispensable. I don't think that's the same thing as metaphysically necessary, and I try to distinguish those. And I think there's a continuum of indispensability. There's, there's your own idiosyncratic psychodynamic indispensability. Um, and then there might be sort of communitarian uh, indispensability. Uh, communities may find certain symbols. And there's even a possibility that certain things might be sort of transcendentally indispensable for us for, you know, for, as human beings. Um, you know, the way we have to see in three dimensions or something like that, even though reality is probably not just three dimensional or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so. I take very seriously what you're saying that uh, if my goal, and it is, is to address the meaning crisis, this is why I talk so much about the religion and not religion, that the, the functionality of religion, and this is what, this is what, and I, I will keep making this case, this is what Nietzsche was pointing to when he said, you don't understand what you've done with the death of God. You, they, they, you have this, you know, this massive functionality, and you can't just, getting rid of the propositions, doesn't you, you have to replace this you have to replace this in some way so I, this is just a way of i think i, I, I I'm, I'm in deep accord with what you're about what you're saying about this um and, well, i was so a, i was about ahead. to say so the devil <laughs> yeah. is when it comes when it comes to scripture is a very interesting figure okay because i mean and you can because in the old testament you don't, you know, there are. Satan, I mean, Satan is not evil in Job, as far as I can see. 
Well, and, and this, gets into, this gets into a lot of deep theological questions that for the sake of scalability have in many ways been um, worked through. Oh, I see. And, Sorry. and, whereas, as, and whereas Jesus, um, you know, very, very clearly talks about, you know, the devil in personified terms. And, and now I'm getting in trouble. Paul Vanderclay doesn't believe in a literal devil. No, I, I, I have no problem that there's a hierarchy of fallen demons and one sits at the top. I don't have a problem with that. But when it comes to the question of ubiquity, it's, um, it, it's, there's just so many questions we can't answer. And okay. if you, if you, if you, I, what I know enough of is enough of the kinds of conversations that different Christian traditions have. And I, if you listen yeah. to the Pentecostals and you listen to the Orthodox and you listen to the Reformed and the cessationists, I mean, and this is a huge difficulty right now, obviously for many who have for, for very good reasons should not spend anywhere near as much time studying the kinds of things that both you and I study. <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> they have right, families right. to feed and people to love and they should go about that business and don't worry about right. us. But, um, and so, but this, this question of the presence of God right. is, is, such a, is such an interesting question because in many ways, if you read, for example, the desert wanderings in the book of Numbers, I mean, the, the, the tabernacle is really a divine containment unit. And when, you know, the Israelites sin in a particularly grievous way and God gets upset, the language is quite literally, he breaks out, which is the same language you would use of a, of a you know, we like would a, use a, a nuclear a, reactor or something. Well, exactly. Well, that's exactly what it's like. And, yeah, and, and you can't get too close to him. You'd better not touch him. And, and of yeah. course, this of course launches all kinds of people on conspiracy theories about aliens, and off we go. But, yeah. um, but, but no, this I, you know, as I'm as I'm continuing to work on this, I mean, my videos, the videos that I do by myself, are just basically what am I working on today in my head? I mean, it's I should yeah. probably be far more organized like you are, but, um, you know, the frame issue, and I look at I look at what I know about theology, and I look sure. at how this works, and I think. You know, we're, we're continuing to work on many of the same problems. And if, no. if you listen to a bunch of my recent conversations, too, you know, I do believe that in many ways um, the, the particular brands of, of atheism that we have in the West today, and I, I, think, this is, I think this is all in many ways, and, and I think this, you track with it in your in your series as well. I mean, this is a result in many ways of the, of the deep issues that were unleashed and, and that we see represented by movements like the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, I think the yeah, Protestant Reformation yeah, and the scientific revolution, yeah, both, both yeah. of them. And, and, and they're very much in dialogue. That's right. Uh, I, I think that's right. Um, and so part of, you know, and so another thing that I really appreciate about your course is, I mean, you really... I had always known, I had, it said, had some implicit knowledge of what I call your four P's of knowing. Um, yeah. And I'm so glad they all have P's because that makes it easier for me I did, to remember. I, I, I did that deliberately. Well, I figured you did. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an old pastor trick because if things are going to scale, you're going to have to think about things yeah, like this. Very much. But, you know, and the more I, you know, got accustomed to it and, and thought about it, um, you know, part of, so one of the, one of the, one of the people in this strange community that has sort of developed in the wake of me doing videos, um, one of the most prominent members of that community is my friend Job, who lives in the Netherlands. Mm. And, and Job is a, so he started watching, he was, he was struggling with depression and a variety of other things, but he's a, successful, he's a successful man in many ways. He's married and he's not necessarily covered, living in his mother's basement covered with Cheeto dust, um, you know, playing <laughs> video games. <laughs> Yeah. But he, um, you know, he starts watching Jordan's videos. He starts watching my videos. And I have many people who contacted me saying, depression, watching Jordan's videos about the biblical series lifted my depression. And I sure. thought, that's interesting. And then, you know, after talking to me and working through stuff, he starts going to church. And 
and then he and the church welcomes it you know gosh churches are so desperate right now that yeah, yeah. <laughs> any, anybody who can fog a glass glass comes in churches will roll out the red carpet and right. starts going to church and, and we have this discord server and we have all of this stuff going on and job is still yeah you know he's, he's almost an evangelist the church almost gave him a job i mean all of this stuff and he's like yeah but i still really i'm not so sure about the god thing and yeah. so you've got all of these other ways of knowing that he's moving into and all of these other, all of these ways, which, and I think your framing of the meaning crisis is, is a far better, you know, is, is a, is a really good frame. And he's got all of these, he's got all of these improvements in his life, but this propositional thing about there being a God, you know, is still something outstanding. And sure. And part of what, you know, we're really working on is, especially after, after the confessional wars, which followed Luther, because yeah. Luther, again, there's this dramatic shift. And you know, it wasn't just Luther, because, you know, if, if you read, you know, something like, uh, what is it, Fatal Discord, the title of the book, it was about Luther and Erasmus. Oh, I can't remember, yeah. Yeah, that book gave me, and I've read plenty of books about the Protestant Reformation, that book gave me a far better picture of just the whoosh yeah. that the Protestant Reformation was and the chaos it, un it unleashed and very how, much. you know, Europe enters certain parts of this Europe, not other parts of Europe, which is very interesting, certain parts of Europe enter this, this fundamental disruption Oh, yeah. That and of course bloodshed of war, right. fair. wars, all these things, and and, 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 and part revolutions what, too. That's right, and and part of what happens after that in the in sort of the next stage of, okay, now there's all chaos, and so we have to bring order to chaos. Is uh, is the is the confessional um, segment of the Protestant Reformation where everyone starts dialing in propositional statements to try to bring order to the right. chaos that was unleashed. And, but now there's all these other ways of knowing. There's the participatory, and they're, they're having skirmishes about that, but it's, it's, it's the question of, okay, why, why this particular level that, yeah. that we certainly trip on but can't live without? And, and so I think part of what, if, if the development of atheism in the West of, of people like Sam Harris who – you know, gosh, he's going to be an atheist, but Jordan Peterson just sort of nails him. Yeah, but you sure do act like the rest of us, yeah. you know, agnostics and Christians. And, um, and, and yeah. so when men, so, so this question of propositionality is something that we're probably going to have to continue to work through yeah. and having an understanding of the other ways of knowing that very much are pertinent to what we're doing. Is, is going to be important to working through those those propositional those propositional conflict areas. I agree with that. I think that's good. I'm trying to connect the two points. I, like so, you've got the idea of God and and the framing, and then that was connected to the the, the way in which God's present, but his but he's omnipresent, but also specially present, right. <laughs> and he can that's break right. out. That's right. Dangerously and, present dangerously present and 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 yeah and and so i get i get i see how that sort of connects with the the, the moreness and uh are, so are you are you comparing the propositions to like the the tabernacle there are attempts to sort of get a, a constrained framing but god can periodically break out from them when we become too idolatrous about them is I that think is that's that a good, good way to say it i hadn't put it quite <laughs> in those terms but that sounds right Okay. Because, uh, because I mean, I mean, think about this. The, the Christian tradition basically says you can't see God. Mm -hmm. That strikes people as strange. Well, what, what do you mean? If I see, if I see God, I will die. Well, that's interesting. Well, mm -hmm. what, what, what is that about? And, and then you connect God in this frame problem. Well, you know, we, we really can't seem to see much of anything without framing. Well, I, I was going to say, it doesn't, I, you don't have to see God for a combinatorially explosive encounter with reality to sort of drive you towards insanity. Um, well, that's exactly right. And especially yeah. in terms of what, you know, we, 
I, I think as a culture really haven't adequately even begun to to deal with, which is of course what Thomas Nagel keeps pointing to, which is that, well, we're all seers in this mix. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we yeah, keep talking yeah. about this stuff as if it's stuff out there and we're, we've got this monarchical vision upon it and we somehow can see it clearly and we're separated from it and it doesn't, but no, we're, we're very much in the mix and we're a product of it. And, and, and that's, that, yeah, and I talk about that when I talk about how that generates cosmic absurdity because we have this view from nowhere, but of course, right, it, it doesn't jive uh, with the fact that we are in the mix, as you put it, and so that 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 you know that unresolvable tension between perspectives is, is what Nagel argues is sort of the driving thing uh, behind um, the experience of absurdity. I, I get into this when I start talking about the perennial problems. Um, uh, one of Nagel's points, by the way, and it sort of goes what we're talking about here, is that that experience of absurdity is not driven inferentially. Uh, the experience of absurdity isn't driven by arguments that lead to it as a conclusion, because the arguments are all actually sort of fallacious or very poor arguments. The arguments are sort of after the fact expressions of this, right? I think I did that in the uh, discussion with Jordan where I talked about, you know, Tom's gonna call Susan and that uh, there's the, right, that, that, that Nagel's whole thing is, right? Humor is when there's a clash between perspectives and we can resolve it with play, but absurdity is when there's a clash between perspectives and we can't play in that liminal place and we can't resolve it through play in some important way. And that's why you can get people right on the edge, like the Monty Python troupe, where absurdity right. and humor are right. so f fecund uh, towards each other. All right. Um, so I, I guess what I, 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 I see something, in a, uh, there's a connection that uh, it just came to my mind and I, 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 I don't know if it's good or not. <clears throat> so I'm saying that it might not be good. Uh, but the way you were talking about God, God's presence, it, it strikes me, and again, I'm not trying to draw an equation here, because but you did invoke this sort of combinatorial explosive nature, so I think it's fair for me to do this. You know, there's a sense in which the combinatorial explosive nature of reality is, and you sort of invoke this, it's not something we can ever see, right? It's, it's in one sense always present, because it's always driving and constraining our relevance realization, but there's another sense in which it's completely absent, because if I, it was actually present in my framing, I would be insane. And that struck me as, again, another, is, are you alluding to that with God yes. sort of? Yes, ah, yes. Wow, you're really cooking with gas. Look, that's, that, that's very, very cool. So not only is God, right, uh, sort of provoking because of his deep connection to, you know, the prohibition on, on ontology, he's, he's provoking that the frame never freezes. He's also in some way giving us a way of holding in mind the presence in absence or the absence in presence of the combinatorial explosive nature of relevance re of, 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 of reality and how that's always impacting on our relevance realization. That's right. That's very good, Paul. Well, I, I, like I, like, I like both of these ideas. I think, I, 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 I think they seem, if, if I've represented them correctly to you, they seem to me very, uh, not, not only plausible, but they seem to me like insightful additions that I would want to bring in. I would give you credit, of course. Uh, I know you would, because you do for everything, which is, which is, I think, part of why people respect you. Um, but I think, I think that's two very, that's, those are two very good points uh, about, um, about, uh, about, I don't know what to call it. I don't want to be dismissive. So I'll just say the symbol of God. Uh, well, and, and this is part of the reason why, you know, when I'm, as I'm working through your stuff, you know, people are, ah, people are doing what people do. But I, I have found, I have found your ideas stimulating and engaging, and I've not found them, I've not found many of them deeply inconsistent with what I understand Mm -hmm. um, the Bible to assert um, through, at least obviously through the context of the religious tradition that I know best. Sure. And I, and so that, you know, it's, it, it, so I mean, some of these, I mean, and this is why I actually think your, your project is very helpful because pastorally, I mean, my job as a pastor is not so much to necessarily do theology, although there might be, be some collateral theology that I do, which is probably what will get me in the most trouble. But um, pastorally, there's all of these elements of the biblical story, which are deeply strange. 
and yes. and yeah. what yeah. happens what happens with within a tradition and within a community where we all, you're always telling these stories that well you're just always dealing with these elements of the story mm -hmm. okay but how do they map onto and this is what theology should actually be doing and has i think not been doing well how do they map on to the world or cognitive science as we yeah. continue to learn about it is are there any mappings here and again as i'm listening to you and trying to understand what you're saying you know some of these issues especially you know i'm i'm looking at this i'm saying this this seems this this doesn't this, this is not problematic from what I can see. So yeah, there's, there's a couple of things to chew on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know quite how to respond. I mean, I would hope I, you would find it provocative. I hope that the work challenges you and, and gives you insight and gives you I, I, like things to think about that you hadn't thought of before. Um, um, uh, so I don't hear you saying that. I don't think you're saying that, oh no, I sort of knew all this ahead of time. Oh no, by no means. No, yeah, because yeah, I, yeah. I was, you know, so, so, and again, what is this, what is this strangeness where you can't see God? Yeah. What's yeah. that about? I, I mean, and we just kind of have a sense of, well, what's that about? And then, and then in time, you know, I've all, I've thought about idolatry for a long time. And, you know, Tim Keller, who, who's a preacher that I've enjoyed. I mean, for a while in the, in the about 2007, 2008, he was, the preachers go through seasons working through different things. And he was working through a lot of ideas about religion and idolatry and, and you know, watching some contemporary things going on in society where, where people will say, well, everything is about this. And so they'll take yeah. one aspect, a, a very legitimate aspect. It might be racism. It might be sexism. It might be classism. It might be, you know, all kinds of things. And then here that one item becomes the lens through which they see everything. Now, on one hand, you always need a frame. You can't see anything without a frame. On the other hand, be careful of the frames that you pick. Yeah, and so, yeah, I, and I try to talk about that um, when I make the distinction between properties of your theory and properties of what your theory is about. So, so, so then in Christianity, basically, Christianity says, well, well God had better be your frame. And now millions of Sunday school kids say, okay, God is my frame. Well, they're not going to use that language. Yeah. But what you've in a sense done in a very scalable way is, is really done something very sophisticated and very interesting to the frame problem. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not a scientific uh, resolution or explanation no. of it, but I understand what we've been talking about. I've been enjoying this idea that what you've done is, I don't know what the word is, uh, don't take this the wrong way, but you've engineered the symbol so that it has these multifunctions in a way that strikes people as completely narratively and symbolically apt. It just like it, it all hangs together in their mind, and yet it has all these facets, all these different functionalities that we've been discussing together, and therefore it becomes, um, you know, a, a very super salient symbol in a lot of ways for people. I can, that's right. That's right. Which yeah. is exactly when you listen to how people use the word God and how God works in their life, even in a very pedestrian day-to-day -day personal relationship with God. Well, God is, yeah. is, as Voltaire says, is simply the most useful thing around, you know, if we didn't have them, we'd have to invent them. Yeah. Now, right. of course, that doesn't speak to ontology and any of many of the other questions people want to deal with. But if you just look at how people live, well, okay, so here's this idol, idol issue. And this has been, you know, it's scaled to the Sunday school, you know, okay, don't worship a statue. Uh, okay. Now it gets a little bit more complicated in the, in the iconoclastic thing. Well, we're we going to get rid right. of statues. Well, is, is the problem really statues? Well, but, the, but that, but that's exactly a feature that I, I, I'm seeing. And that's what I like about what you're proposing because the scalability goes with the thing I'm saying about like what I said with Plato, I, you know, it transforms me. And then as I'm transformed, it now can speak to me anew. I go out in the world and see things anew and then I come back and it's so right. It go, it, I, and that's for me, because you see this in Tillich, you see this in Young, and Durley's work on Young brings this out. You know, symbols die. They can die. And, um, and so one of the things that I, that I think says a symbol isn't dying is when it can do exactly that. Like, like it can, to use your language, it can scale, or to use my language, like it's this ongoing, it's this inexhaustible fount of intelligibility. It keeps. But one of the things you've done that I didn't do, 
which I think is very, very good, right? I was just talking about sort of the, the moreness, but you're pointing to, yeah, but the symbol also gives you a line of continuity uh, between that, right? Um, so there, it, you know, a Deleuzian kind of thing. I don't know Deleuze very well, but I've been, I was talking to somebody who, you know, this idea that, you know, there's, a, there's the repetition with the difference, which is like what evolution is doing, right? The repetition with the difference, right? <laughs> That's right. So, right, so, you know, you know, don't, you know, don't worship idols, but I repeat that, but now when I come back, oh, that, but that means this too, and this too, and this too, and this too. That's what we've been doing together. So it's not only, it's not only that it tracks you, like I was going to say horizontally, I mean by that like a horizon, it tracks you, it gives you a horizon to the inexhaustible. What you're pointing to, and this is something that Guy, Guy Sandstock talks about, not only the horizon, it's also laying out a ground for you. There's, there's a continuity of a path there, so that every time I come back to the prohibition on idols, I, I'm, in one sense I'm doing the same thing, no idols, but in another sense, it's evolving and it's, and it's expanding what it means for me. Am I capturing what you're yes, saying? Yes, yes, well? yes. That's right. Well, and, and it keeps scaling. I mean, again, yeah. it's inexhaustible because, okay, so then you're having discussions with other pastors and stuff and, and someone says, yeah, but you know, that whole idol thing, well, you can sort of make an idol of God in your head. It's like, right. Well, I, I need, I, right. I can't, I can't, I can't help but relate to God without some representation, but then it comes back and says, yes, but <laughs> but your your representation is itself idolatrous and so it's going to have to yeah it's until going it to have struggles to, against that i that's mean right. that's it's what going he to means. have to give yeah yeah and and of course we we can't i mean none of us do this none of us do this well but again as i've said to to many who want to simply disparage religions well well, well think about think about what religion has actually done through the course of the world it's maintained it's maintained these conversations and, you know, whatever, however problematic or difficult these sacred texts become, these sacred texts actually become baselines and all of their teachings grow and it actually affords, you know, continued progress and development and all of these things. It's, again, it's, it's a wonderful tool. And then again, if you think about, even if you look at, you know, I've got plenty of I've got plenty of thoughts about Jordan's ideas about, because he jumps right into this with his biblical series and his ideas about, you know, uh, the development of this and, and all of that is, is terribly, you know, is, is, is fiercely discussed in, in well, it's fraught, it's fraught with a lot of stuff. That's right. It, it, but, but you begin to, but you say, you know, what, what an amazing, and I, what an amazing what an amazing thing has happened. And I was studying the book of Ezekiel with my adult Sunday school class a couple of years ago. And I'm, I'm just thinking about how on earth was it that these, that Jerusalem gets captured and these Hebrews have the temerity to say their God did it to them. And you're just like, yeah. So anyway, so anyone. <laughs> That's cool. So there's 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 maybe what I have to bring to this conversation. I don't know if if you have anything you want to throw in the throw in the potluck well, now. I I mean I think that's all good. I, I I would say that there's deeply analogous things in others' traditions. Sure. There's the very, very famous Zen thing, which people don't quite understand, but if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him, uh, which is exactly don't turn the Buddha into anything that prevents you from, you know. Be becoming enlightened, there, 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 there's similar kinds of prohibitions. Um, and I, I, I'm also wondering um, a little bit, when you were talking about religion there, I, I thought of the David Hume quote, right? That the, the worst things come from the best things turned bad. Um, <laughs> it, so, 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 so an argument is, you know, the, re the, the, re the reason why religion is capable of, at times, you know, titanic uh, evil and suffering, is precisely because it is such a powerful and in some sense such a, I would say a good thing for, for human beings. Um, the same thing with p politics, the same thing with the state, the same thing with the market, the same thing with language, the same thing with technology, right? Et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, these, the, these things that are capable of great evil are precisely capable of great evil precisely because of their enormous capacity for great good. And, th and I, Part of what I again, part of what I'm trying to do, not only am I trying to get a discourse that could bring, you know, atheists and theists and non-theists all to the table, they wouldn't ultimately converge on a set of shared propositions, but they could do what we're doing here and have really fruitful and interesting discussion. Yeah. 
I also want I also want to get a language that is responsible to both sides and you know to this issue. That's why I'm, you know I'm, I'm I'm very careful about the, the aspects I'm talking about. I try to make distinctions between religio and credo because, like you, because you 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 often mention it, you know. I'm concerned with, and, and I think it connects with the idolatry stuff we've talking about. I'm, I'm concerned about how religions do become regularly and reliably idolatrous in <laughs> very, very powerful ways. And and I take Verse Lewis very, very seriously in his book on the New Inquisitions. That you know it was things like the Inquisition and 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 the the persecution of heresy and the creation of these systems, you know, that make the great secular totalitarian ty tyrannies also possible yeah. they, they're templates yeah. for the you know for the marxist for the well at least the communists uh, maybe we should make a distinction between marxists and communists but you know for the communists and the nazis uh, and, and and stuff like that so yeah i i i i i, I want to capture both of those aspects of what i'm trying to do and, and so i i think and this sounds so small but it's it, it's not meant to be I think that by, that by valence goes back to the fact that the very same machinery that makes us adaptive is the machinery that makes us prone to self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. One of the constant themes I'm trying to make is, I think the bivalence we're seeing at the, this is a platonic argument, right? The bivalence we see writ large on these large scales of human spirituality and religion, we see it writ small, but writ deeply into the spirituality of, uh, of human meaning cultivation. So that's what I wanted to say about that. I think there's a deep connection there. You know, the, the issues, the issues of of pluralism, um, of okay. So you've got you've got you know Christians over here and their exclusive nature, and you've got other religious traditions who are less exclusive and and sometimes more and sometimes more. Um, I mean, all of this, all of this too, is is something something that we have to continue it's something we'll continue to work through and struggle at because mm. as is almost always the case the first answers have a degree of truth to them but also some some real issues and the first yeah. answers are yes and no okay well and and just like when we talked earlier about tribes there's there's a sense in which you know i need my tribe but also a sense in which my tribe is a problem yeah and yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and and you know and so when it comes to I mean, obviously, Christianity has within it some assertions that are exclusive. Well, yep. every every religion, every religion that's going to it does. I mean, yeah, every religion is going to have to have that, yep. and and so then I think it's helpful to recognize that. Okay, it's not just a religion out there, but it's my judgment on that religion out there, and mm -hmm. and so then own my judgment as my judgment, and 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 hopefully. You know, find a way, and and I, you know, I feel I feel a little bit bad about, you know, beating up on Brett Weinstein because he he hasn't contacted me yet to defend himself. But I and I and I also do have a, a I don't know, I, I I I on one hand don't want to come across as as too um, accommodating, but at the same time I also don't want to come across as too shrill. And yeah, yeah. and but there is a it, there seems to be a, my, my wife, my wife, I, I almost never talk about my wife in my videos, but my wife is now, she, she wanted to take a class. So she's taken an online class with a, in a university in Texas and she wanted to take an English class. And so suddenly she found herself in a class on post secularism and she starts, yeah. she starts reading stuff. And she, she's never read any philosophy since college. And that was 30 years ago. She's reading yeah. about Nietzsche and Kant. And she starts talking to me about this. I'm like, what kind of a class are you taking? Yeah, she never <laughs> watches any of my videos. And, and it just, you know, listening to Brett, watching what my wife is taking, listening to you. We, we've obviously come to a point where we need tools to address what is, what is clearly threatening us. And and I think we've we've had enough of a distance from totalitarian religious traditions acting in totalitarian ways that we we're getting a little bit less reactive to yeah, the idea yeah. of religion, and so we're beginning to admit some of its utility, and and so we, we're we're sort of opening up and affording well let's have people talk across these lines. 
and let's see if we can learn from each other. And let's see if together, and, and we can say, well, I've learned a lot from these people who are not Christians over here. And without necessarily going the other step of, oh, it's all the same. Like, no, no, it's not all the same. I, I don't think Huxley's right. I mean, I think, I, I, Aldous Huxley, uh, the perennial philosophy. I, I, I mean, my position is I think the processes of things like relevance realization are universal, but I think the products are completely historically culturally variable. And so that's why I'm neither a perennialist nor a relativist. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a true pluralist uh, because for pluralism, you need, there's, there has to be something universal, but, there, but it has to also explain the, the, the real variation. Um, and so I, I, I said something about that. Do you think about Weinstein though, as I, I mean, part of, part, of, part of what I heard you saying, and, and I understand you're saying more than this, but part of what I heard you saying is, this is all psychological, but you're not getting at the existential and ontological aspects of religion, and that there's a deep functionality there, and that the psychological is deeply immersed with the existential and the ontological, and you're seeing things in too shallow of a manner. Is that a fair representation of what you were saying, at least part of it? I, I think so. I, my main okay. critique is that I have, he, he seems to play this move where he says, his, his, his day job is saying, is explaining human behavior on the basis of biological of evolution. Evolution, evolution. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then he says, well, we've arrived at a crisis. And so we simply have to transcend our programming. And I'm like, no, no. Yeah, I but, don't understand but, the difference between your day job and your religion. Or, I mean, I, I don't understand how you don't see the dissonance between your day job and your religion. <laughs> well, what I was alluding to is he understands at one level the adaptivity of religion. And that's what he's invoking when he says we need hmm. something like religion in order so that we can bring about the transformation uh, that we need to address these crises, yes. right? And you compared that to my religion of no religion. So that's, I'm picking up on that. Yes. And then, and, and, and yes, and then he invokes, of course, the notion of self-transcendence. And what I thought you were pointing to is, well, this is deeper than just sort of a psychological trick. Yes. You know, self-transcendence is a much more existential ontological thing. That's what I'm trying to point to. Yes. And, you, and you're not getting how, you know, religion gets us into the existential and ontological levels, not only also within the psyche, but it discloses aspects of the world uh, that have to be taken into account. Um, so that's what I heard. That's what I drew as an implication from what you were saying. Yeah. Well, I think I think that is I think that is true. I I'm probably responding at a low resolution to watching him make a turn and think you neither take your day job nor your proposed religion seriously enough because all of this goes all of this goes so much deeper. Which again yeah. is is part of what I've 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 deeply appreciated about your work and well, the fact you. that you have offered your work in such a um, in such a public and um, in, in a way you know I, I I'm really pleased that your your friends and and, and students um, leaned on you to to do this <laughs> course and to and to wade into this strange uh, this strange new um, new profession that you have taken on well, I love it, and, and to, to quote to quote Sibylla King, I love this corner of the internet. I mean, I really do. I love the people that I'm meeting, and I, you know, it, 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 it's kind of like it's not simply a corner. There's sort of overlapping things. There's yeah. you and I and Jonathan and and Sibylla, but there's also Guy, but there's also Rebel Wisdom, and yeah. right, there's all these people, and, and, and you know, there's all this stuff going on uh, that I I think is just so interesting uh, and exciting. And, and, it, and frankly, it's. I mean, here's where I, I would agree with one. So I mean, it's. It, I mean, um, it's really urgent. We, we, yeah. We've got to. We've got yeah. to address a lot of stuff, and we've got to do it. It's getting. In fact, it's getting more and more urgent, and we've yeah. got to do something about it. And I'm not a politician. I'm not a financier. I can't move those pieces on the chessboard around. Yeah. I don't have that power. I don't have that influence. Yeah. I'm a cognitive scientist. So, insofar as the meaning crisis is exacerbating and preventing us from you know, addressing these other issues. And I think you can make a very good case that it's doing that. That's, how, that's my attempt to, well, here it is. This is so hubristic, but this is my attempt to try and save the world, right? Um, and yeah. so, uh, I mean, I, I appreciate all of the people that I feel are in good fellowship about that project. Oh, here, here, I agree. So we've been going for a little while. Um, I don't have a time constraint. I don't know if there's anything you want to bring up or if we want to close it here or what you'd, what you'd no, like to I, do. I, I'm really happy with how this went. 
I don't have any sort of uh, irons in the fire that need to be hammered right now. Um, okay. okay. Uh, I mean, at some point, I'd like to, you know, we can come back uh, to talk about some of these issues again. I would like at some point, like I say, to, you know, get your take on. So the last four episodes of the series, which won't air until like February. So I'm not saying we have to wait till February to talk. Uh, February. Well, only, well, uh, <laughs> or maybe, maybe, no, maybe it's January. Maybe it's January. But anyway, the last four episodes are on people that I call, and I, and I try to make clear that I'm using this respectfully because I'm trying to, right? I call them the prophets in the Old Testament sense of the meaning crisis. And I'm, you know, I'm doing Heidegger and Corbin and Young and Tillich and Barfield and with some other people along the way. Yeah. It's sort of the chorus of those people. And I would, I, I, I would deeply appreciate um, uh, feedback on, 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 the, on the profits of the meaning crisis from you. Uh, I, think, I think that would be like this, di like this dialogue was. I think it would be mutually insightful and beneficial to your viewers and to viewers of my series because uh, what I, after I, I sort of finished the argument, uh, episode 46, I, I then put it into dialogue with these other people that I regard as seminal, you know, people wrestling with the advent and trying to articulate in a profound way uh, the meaning crisis. So uh, I would I would appreciate you know uh, you know I, 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 uh, an at like discussion about that. Okay. Well, I I think that will that's quite doable. I think we can thank Google for this very interesting tool called YouTube that <laughs> has you know, been, I think, yeah, there's a lot of craziness and maybe a lot of stupidity, but also some really cool stuff. The idea that you and I can have this conversation in an affordable way for a pastor and a, and a university professor, neither of which are necessarily high, you know, high paying careers. <laughs> and we can put something out this and a few thousand people who are interested yeah. can watch it. And, and I've said this many times, uh, the, for me, I, Anyway, I have a little Patreon site and people do support me on that a little bit. And, but for me, the most gratifying, the most gratifying thing of this whole experience has been watching a community develop. Yeah, very much. Where, I agree. where people are having conversations with each other. And people such are, insightful people. Oh. Like these, pe these people come, like, you know, you know, you got Sevilla and now Mary has joined, right? Yes. Mary Cohen. Yeah. And she, I mean, the, the two videos she's done on my work, those were excellent. I mean, I have criticisms of them, but those are, you know, those are, I think, you know, respect, deeply respect. The, that, that, that was excellent stuff. I mean, it was, yes, it was great. I liked it a lot. Yeah. I mean, it, I, like, it's just, uh, it's, yeah, the, the, the people that are getting involved, I mean, at some point, we, we, we need to have a, a big conference get together in which we get all these people, we get all the people together and we, we just sort of uh, spend some time just celebrating. Uh, that would be that would be a very good thing to do. No, I, I agree. And, and we've talked about that a little bit on the channel and that's going to have to happen. But and, and it even, you know, it goes beyond, you know, Mary and you know, so many people and, and to have that was the most craziest thing. You know, I started making videos and people start contacting me. I want to talk to you. And then yeah. we talk and then other people want to talk. And again, as a oh, pastor, I just to see people knit together into community where they're and, 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 and such I, diverse people. And I'm so I'm meeting some amazing people. I mean, I met Guy through this. Yeah. I met uh, Jordan Hall. He and I have had amazing conversations. We're going to have another one shortly. Um, I just met Jamie Wheel. I had a wonderful conversation with him. I just had a wonderful conversation with Alexander Bard. Um, uh, just uh, uh, yeah. you, you'd be really interested in his book on synthism. Um, um, it's what's it called? Uh, Creating God in the Internet Age. It's re I'm starting to read it. It's a really interesting book. Um, he's a really really interesting. Uh, um, uh, thinker, uh, really interesting guy. Uh, so I like it's just it, it, yeah. it, it's 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 just continuing to unfold in in a way that I keep finding <laughs> I keep finding shocking, and I just uh, but delightfully shocking in a good yes, way. Yes, yes. No. Anyways, I don't want to keep you. All right. So. Well, thank you so much, John. I will post this tomorrow, and um, I think yeah, we'll see where it goes. We'll see what. What new things, <laughs> new ideas come out. Percolate out of it. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Come back at us. So okay. take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.